no, no introductions or anything like that. I'll introduce myself. Um, but first, I have to remember. I'm David. <laughs> I'm not David, I'm David. So that's how you distinguish it. There's a day and a day. I'm not David. I'm not David. I'm not David. Okay. As you can see at the moment, I work in Canada, though you can tell from my accent that I'm very British. Um, but but um, I'm actually now a dual Canadian British national. So I have two passports. Um, my son, who was born in Thailand, my wife is Thai, now has three passports. So we're a multilingual family, though we're now in an English speaking country. Um, obviously, my, my focus. Uh, today, as you can see from the title, is it's, it's not just about the language. I'm talking mainly about English and state education systems, and I'm going to uh, go through I just have to, I have to remember to point this in the right place um, to make sure that I am coordinated. So, I have a quick um, talk about, talk about um, syllabus and curriculum, social context of curriculum reform, teachers and teaching in social context, values, resources, which are important, processes in teaching and learning, English for the 21st century, curriculum development for learners, and conclusion. But that's a lot, isn't it? So, that's everything. Everything you really wanted to know about the curriculum and its development in the next hour or so. And um, I hope we'll have a lot of food for thought before lunch. And then we have our food for lunch. I see also we have the evaluation form on the, on the table. You have to say what you can gain from the uh, seminar. Usually with these things, like with the lunches and the snacks and the cakes, I usually write that I've gained about five kilos. <laughs> so, as well as the, the academic and the intellectual stimulation as well. So we have this ambitious agenda here. Um, to begin with, I think that says, um, yes, syllabus and curriculum. You have to excuse me because I don't speak Spanish or Portuguese. So I, I do speak quite a lot of French and I speak quite a lot of Thai. But these, of course, are really useless here. <laughs> <laughs> useful elsewhere, but uh, not so good here. So I should learn at least Spanish. Spanish speakers would tell me I should learn Spanish because, of course, there, there are more speakers of Spanish than there are Portuguese. And you can just about make yourself understood here in, 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 in Brazil. Maybe I should learn Portuguese because I'm in, in, I'm in Brazil. Learning languages is fun. Um, including English. And one of the problems for me with English language teaching throughout the world in the countries that I've worked is that it's not fun. So at, at the heart of the problem for me with, 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 with curriculum is we have a lot of very good intentions, but once we get down to the level of the classroom with the children and, and, and the teachers, it's often not fun. So how can we make it fun? So today I, I'm uh, talking about things from the level of designers. Okay? Uh, I'm not so much concerned with the, with the syllabus, the statement of teaching content in the order in which it is to be taught. That, that's to do with the, the language, the functions, the skills, the grammar, the vocabulary, and so on. That, for me, is actually a relatively easy thing to deal with. But I'm not going to talk about it today because it, it's, it's something which is easier for people, I think. And also, the, the syllabus is this statement of content which is to be tested. And we've been talking a lot about uh, testing itself and the impact that this has on classroom teaching and learning. It's incredibly important to make these things congruent, uh, teaching and testing. And Rebecca was mentioning that, and other people mentioned it, and I'll mention it again later as well. So, what I'm talking about is the curriculum develop the processes that are used to determine the needs of a group of learners, develop aims or objectives for a program to address those needs, to determine an appropriate syllabus or structure, teaching methods and materials, to carry out an evaluation of the language program that results from these processes. So the curriculum is the broader document and it encompasses a syllabus. 
So in different places, people get confused between what is a curriculum and what is a syllabus. So for me, the curriculum is the broad thing, the syllabus is, is the, the more narrow thing, the statement of teaching content. The thing about curriculum also is that it can be a legal document. So I have an example. This is an introduction from the lower sanctuary English curriculum for Vietnam. Uh, I went to Vietnam a couple of years ago and I was involved in, in the curriculum design there with a group of um, people from the Vietnamese National Institute for Educational Sciences. So this was a very much a, a top-down process. We developed the curriculum and then it went out for review for feedback. So in certain places, Though it might be, as we've discovered, it's ideal to get bottom-up involvement right from the very start of the process. In some places, that's just not possible. And, and Vietnam is one of those places. So this is a legal document. As it says, this curriculum document is the legal basis for managing, teaching and learning English at lower secondary level. Developing guidelines for curriculum implementation. Compiling and selecting teaching and learning materials, including textbooks, workbooks, teachers' guidebooks, supplementary materials, and electronic resources. Informing teaching and learning methodology at lower secondary level. Designing and selecting teaching aids and equipment. Assessing students' progress and achievement. And also, remember Rebecca was mentioning this, developing pre- and in-service development programs for teachers, administrators, and teacher educators. Now, it's the law. They have to follow what is in the curricula. It's the law. So this, to a certain extent, solves the problem of, of getting people on board. In, in, in Vietnam, which is a communist society, they're told to do it. So in theory, they have no choice. But as we all know, what happens in theory and what happens in practice can be radically different. But at least in theory, everybody is working towards the same objectives, in theory. So, uh, so the curriculum can be uh, the, the legal basis. So, this is um, very much in the, in the legal basis, the curriculum um, as intended by policy makers and designed by curriculum developers. And that's what I'm talking about today. So, um, I know that um, the curriculum has, has implemented by teachers or the curriculum has experienced by students uh, are extremely important. But everybody, every student experiences the curriculum differently. Every teacher interprets it differently. So I'm not able to obviously provide much information about those today. That would, that would be a separate presentation. So my focus is on how we're developing this curriculum as intended. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the social context of curriculum reform. So as we all know, the curriculum itself is not developed in isolation. And that one of the key things that a curriculum has to do is to reflect and encapsulate the values of society at large. And we can see that how that's done in, for example, I've got an example here from the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. I was working in India recently. And they have this state curriculum framework, which has this uh, wonderful uh, objective here. It is our primary objective to reach English to every child of the state and to ensure that the ch child gains a sufficiently high level of efficiency in it and does not suffer discrimination for lack of it. Okay? That's, a, that's a very um, unequivocal, ambitious, but wonderful objective. That no child should be suffering discrimination because they don't 
have access to English. And they, so the state government's objective is to provide every child with the same level of access to English, no matter what their background. And as one of the problems, again, for me with the teaching of English, is English is one of those languages throughout the world where if you have money, if you have concerned parents, if you're a member of the elite, then you have access to it. And what you do with English when you've got it is you use it as a language of exclusion. We have English, you don't have English. We're at the top, you stay at the bottom. And in many countries in which I've worked, um, that that remains the case. In a country like Sri Lanka, where I spent a, long, a certain number of years as well, the people at the top have English. Children from the, the rural areas find it very difficult to get hold of English. Which then means, of course, they find it more difficult to get to university. They find it more difficult to get employment. So for me, one of the key objectives for any curriculum would be something like this. How to ensure that we have equal access to the opportunities that English may bring to people. Another um, thing that's often considered with, um, social, uh, with the social context of curriculum reform, the curriculum is often changed because of some kind of failure in, in a previous curriculum. And another place in which I work, Thailand, the introduction to the basic education core curriculum in Thailand um, had this to say. Problems and issues of concern included the previous curriculum to provisions, application process and results. Among the problems identified, among them, were confusion and uncertainty faced by practitioners in educational institutions in preparing school curriculums. The majority of schools are ambitious in prescribing learning content on contents and expected outcomes. The measurement and evaluation did not correlate with the standards set with negative effects on certification and transfer of learning achievements. Furthermore, issues of learner's quality resulting from acquisition of essential knowledge, skills, capacity, and desirable characteristics and attributes were quite disconcerting. And if those were uh, among the problems and issues, you could see that it was a complete disaster. <laughs> Well, perhaps if they prepared it better, it wouldn't have been such a disaster. So they obviously, if you have a situation with the curriculum where this kind of thing happens, then you haven't prepared it properly. Obviously any curriculum will have some kind of problems and issues in the implementation which are unforeseen. But if this happens, you've not done it right. You definitely have not even thought about how the curriculum should be prepared. So we, we have to, whatever we're doing, we have to avoid this kind of situation. So, um, as we can see from... Okay, I'm oh sorry, I need to coordinate myself again. Um, So this the relationship between social context and, and curriculum reform is, is something which is very important and it's also very complex. Again, if we're to avoid these kind of issues which happened in Thailand, we do need to make sure that, that we're doing things properly. And the example I have again from the uh, introduction to the lower secondary English curriculum is they, they have thought about why it is they want to teach English. Why are we doing this? It is a question which you have to, th to think about also for Brazil. Why is it important for children in Brazil to have English? Do they really need it? Does every child in every school need to have English? Why? And until you've answered that basic question, there's no point going any further. In, in many of the countries in, in which I am currently working, and I continue to work, I do think, well, I'm not so sure that everyone needs it. But governments think that people need it. And this is, as we see here, this is, you'll see this often in the introduction to, to a national curriculum. They say here, 
across the world today. Processes of globalization have seen interaction and interdependence amongst nations growing rapidly. Increasingly, English is seen to be important for national economic development and regional integration, as well as leading to a greater appreciation of other cultures. So we, we have these sort of supposed benefits from if we have if we have English, it helps the economy. My, my response to that would be, prove it. <laughs> because I think that the, the, the actual evidence is, is not so clear. Um, in Thailand, which I'm very familiar with, there isn't a great deal of English spoken, even though everybody learns it. And yet, year upon year, the economy seems to grow at quite a healthy pace. Japan, third largest economy in the world. In, again, English is not widely spoken. So what is this link between the economy and English? It may be important for small countries, if you think of places like Singapore, if you think of the Nordic countries, of, of Sweden, Norway, uh, Denmark, where there is a high level of English, but they are countries which have to look Outwards. You have a large country like Brazil, very big population. Is English so important for the economy? So I don't know. You have to you have to provide those answers. But make sure that if we're going to do something which is going to require hundreds of thousands and millions of children in schools throughout the country to be learning English, then make sure that you have the evidence to support um, claims like this. The other one about the greater appreciation of other cultures. Yes, of course. Knowing a language, any language, helps you to appreciate that, that um, culture much more readily. I can appreciate Thai culture much more through speaking some Thai. Even though I'm not fluent in Thai, I have enough Thai to understand and appreciate the culture. My French is much better, and I have a great fondness for French culture. So yes, through the language I, I can appreciate that, that culture, and that for me is a given. So if we have a focus on learning English for intercultural understanding, I can appreciate that much more readily than learning English for national economic development, where I think the case is often not proven. So learning languages is, for me, essentially good. And for me, the more languages you know, the better. That, for me, is a given. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be great for economic development. But it's good for you, as a person, to speak many languages. So if you are bilingual, it's great. If you are trilingual, better. If you are multilingual, even better. So an appreciation of other cultures through language is to me a very sensible objective. Again, information technology. Simultaneously, information technology has led the move towards knowledge and information-based societies in which English plays a prominent role. Thus, developing community competence in English in lower secondary school will provide students with a lifelong skill for education, employment, and leisure. Maybe. Yes, learning a language can provide you with, with this lifelong skill for appreciation of other cultures. It may help you with employment. It may help you with leisure. But the thing about the inter internet now, as you all know, is you no longer need English to access everything on the internet. There, is, there are multiple web pages in Thai, in Portuguese, in Spanish, in Mandarin, Arabic. So yes, at the dawn of the internet, then English was, was the language of the internet, but no longer. So again, this is, is something which is now questionable. So for me, the only thing which remains of all this is learning languages is good. It's always good. It's always good to learn languages. It's 
good for the brain, and it's good for appreciating other cultures. It, learn, learning a language is something, another person's language, helps to bring us together. And there is so much in the world at the moment which is dividing us, that anything which brings us together and learns, helps us to appreciate other cultures, other ways of life, other religions, so that we do not demonize other groups because they are different, is good. So I don't know any Arabic, but if I knew Arabic, I'm quite sure that I would appreciate Muslim cultures much better. I have some knowledge of Muslim cultures, but I can learn more through the language. Perhaps if more of us learn Arabic, then we would not be demonizing Muslims. 99% of Muslims are not terrorists. <laughs> but if we, if we read our popular presses, we, we would think that they were. And that, that for us, to me, is very sad. So, we think about values. Our curriculum for government schools should go beyond language and skills. It should instantiate values of the wider society explicitly and implicitly. If we think about explicit values, then the curriculum should focus on gender equality. Extremely important. It should focus on tolerance and respect for other belief systems than our own. It should focus on promotion of cultural, intercultural understanding. So these are, these are explicit things. So when I was in, in Sri Lanka designing textbooks for um, primary schools for English, we had to make sure, because it was a, a multi-ethnic community, we had to make sure that we had the representation of, of Tamils, of Sinhalese and Muslims. We had to make sure that there was gender balance between boys and girls. All of these things should be explicit. And then I'm obviously preaching to the converted here, but if you have a textbook in which all of the doctors are men and all of the nurses are women, there is a problem. So again, as we all know, there are many successful women as doctors, accountants, lawyers, politicians, and so on. But are, are these things represented in the textbook for primary schools? or secondary schools, they should be there. There should be this gender balance in representations of what men and women do in the textbooks. So if we have an English language textbook, why is there not a picture of a man at home doing the ironing? Yeah. <laughs> they don't have one. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't have one. Why not? Why should they not portray these things? I do the ironing at home. Take a picture of me. So many of many of us males, we do the ironing, the laundry, the same way that many men cook, and so on and so forth. So that there sh we should not be limiting children's options through the representations that we have in the textbooks. It's really important, and implicitly. Uh, in the curriculum. <coughs> the curriculum represents social roles for teachers and students through the teaching methods. And again, in, in many societies, um, what we see, say like this, um, explicit, okay, let, we'll do the explicit ones first. Going back to my example from Vietnam. As well as contributing to personal fulfillment, Learning English can contribute to mutual understanding and promote a sense of global citizenship. Yes, it can. By learning about other languages and cultures, students not only use English as a bridge to intercultural understanding, but also can gain insights into our own society and culture. We think about our own society and culture through the lens of, of another language. Learning English should be done within a framework which fosters the acquisition of lifelong learning skills and cultivates in students sound moral values and a sense of citizenship appropriate to participation in Vietnamese society. So just because you are learning English doesn't mean that you become any less Vietnamese or any less Thai or any less Spanish or any less 
Brazilian. It's just an additional skill, an additional way of looking at the world. If I learn French, it doesn't mean that I, I'm a subject of French imperialism. I happen to like learning French. I like French literature, culture. But I'm also, I'm British, I'm also Canadian. So we need to, to make sure that, that I think this idea, yes, English has enormous power in the world, but that doesn't mean that if you learn it, that you are then an agent of, of American imperialism. The age, the age of British imperialism is long over. So it's a question of taking that language and making it our own and using it for our own purposes. If English is as, as it is, it's a global language, in more and more it doesn't belong to anybody. Or if it does belong, it belongs to multiple people. It, it's an American language, it's a British language, it's a Canadian language, it's an Indian language. And so on. And it could also become a Brazilian language, simply part of the repertoire. But it's never going to replace the Portuguese, ever. So we have to think of it as something which, through which we can, again, promote the, the values of the society. Not, not to work against them, but, but to promote them. And again, I once went to Saudi Arabia and I was talking there about how English, through English, Muslims could represent themselves to the wider world so that people would understand them better. So not to see English in Saudi Arabia as something which brought in foreign values and foreign influences, but it would help people to understand Islam and Muslims better because they could represent themselves better. So again, this mutual understanding. Now, if we're thinking about these implicit um, roles that we have, how is it that teachers and students are, are represented in, in the curriculum? How do we see the teachers in our curriculum? Is the teacher, is it, does we still have the teacher controlling everything? Is the teacher still the source of all knowledge? Or is the teacher somebody who facilitates students learning? Again, that will be represented in the curriculum. What about the, the students? As, as, as Dave Peck was saying yesterday, are they in the empty buckets? Receiving all the wisdom of the teacher? Or are our students independent thinkers? Are they co-constructors of knowledge in the classroom? <coughs> so we have to get in the curriculum to think about these roles. As to throw through that, it's the processes of teaching and learning that we, we need to consider. Again, if we have our curriculum as a legal framework, then we can say, you must teach in this way. <laughs> but it may not happen. Because there may be conflict between the recommended ways and the ways which, which people have always taught. And these things, again, it's very difficult to, to, to change them, as we, as we will see. So, the, the processes... Uh, Sorry, I've gone too far. We, how, how is our learning um, envisaged? Are we teacher-centered? We learn a center, or we learn a center. And as we're considering the teaching of English, is, is what we do in the classroom, is it consistent with what we know about second language acquisition theories and research? So we, we do study how people learn other languages through SLA. So is our curriculum also consistent with those, with that knowledge of how people learn other languages? should be. So, if you think about our processes, 
for me, for me, an effective curriculum would be something which is learning centered, not just learner centered. Because people often have problems with something which is learner centered because they believe it's taking away from the teacher's role. But if you're learner-centered, what do I do? I'm gone as a teacher. But for me, learning means that we're focusing on what the teacher does and what the learners do, which contribute to the learning in the classroom. So for me, problems often occur in, in curriculum reform projects when the roles and behaviours which are advocated for teachers and learners don't fit with society's expectations. So society still has this expectation perhaps of the teacher is somebody who instructs. The children are there to learn. The teacher tells them what they need to know and they receive that. So we have to work to change these perceptions if, if they exist. So the learner-centered curriculum might be seen as depriving teachers of their, their roles in the classroom as providers of knowledge. But the learning-centered um, curriculum attempts to balance roles. Teachers and learners both have a role to play in achieving student learning. So we're not excluding the teacher and saying, learners, you have to do it all yourself. We still have our part to play in this. And again, finally, we mustn't forget consideration of how people learn other languages. There is plenty of research on that. And one of the things it tells us about learning any language is there is an order of acquisition. As teachers of the English language, we always stress about third person singular present simple tense. He, she, or it likes, or sings, or, or whatever. Eats, sleeps, prays. And as teachers, we know we spend a lot of time in the classroom focusing on this silly little S. But research tells us it's late acquired. So why do we yeah, we have to, may have to introduce it early. But why would we expect mastery of it when it is late acquired? So if you do introduce it early, don't waste your time expecting your students to, to become conversant and fluent and competent in this in the first few weeks of an English class. They won't. Yes, they will do their exercises and they'll put that S there. As soon as they step outside, it's gone. And that's because they are not ready for it. They haven't reached the level at which they will acquire it. So what we know about SLA, things like that, there are stages in the acquisition of all languages, which we, natural stages which we go through. The natural stages for the acquisition of negatives. I know understand. That's the natural, we're not going to say, I'm sorry, but I don't understand. We always start saying, no understand. That's how we even start. So we have to realize that. But we have to also realize that within structure, what happens with teaching is that learners go through these stages faster than they would do without instruction. And that's our job, to help um, our learners through these things much more quickly. So, we now have a different example of, um, of how these curriculum teaching and learning processes from Papua New Guinea. English is a practical subject, and teaching and learning must reflect this. Learning will be done through practical activities. Students will learn by speaking and listening, creative thinking and doing. The English syllabus uses a student-centered approach as a vehicle to guide and facilitate students' learning. A student-centered approach provides students with the opportunity to practice and develop critical and creative thinking 
problem solving, decision making, as well as a range of practical skills and knowledge. And then they, they go on to, to say this. A student-centered approach means that teaching and learning approaches need to be flexible, as Dave was saying earlier, to cater for individual differences, and learning should be relevant and meaningful to the experiences and needs of the students. A student-centered approach allows teachers to be more flexible in determining the most effective way to help all students achieve the English learning outcome. So even though they say it's student-centered, for me this would actually be learning-centered, because the teacher's role is still here. And then we have these other things about students learning best through active involvement and so on. In English, students are encouraged to think critically about their learning, to take responsibility for their own learning, to teach each other, to learn from each other, to work cooperatively and to work individually. And often when we have children, we see children in the classroom working together, we think they're cheating. No. They can be learning from each other. So, if you think about resources for learning um, within the classroom, then it is the teacher, the student, working together. It's all partnership. So, next, resources, which again are going to affect what we are able to do. I was talking a little bit about this yesterday, but these things again are extremely important. In realistic Objectives. Oh, sorry. How much time have you got? How many lessons a week? Two lessons a week here. 45, 50 minutes? 40 weeks of the year maybe? Not much time. What resources do you have to support the learning? Computers? Have you got computers? Do you have Wi-Fi? Is there broadband? Do you have textbooks? Are there workbooks? What kind of other materials are available? What about the classroom? Do you have lots of things like art supplies? Do you have furniture? Is the furniture fixed? Can you move it about? What can you do? And most important in thinking about what you can achieve, the availability of English in the environment. It's no good saying, my students are going to become fluent by the end of high school if they have two lessons a week for 40 lessons a year for six or seven years and they don't practice at all outside the classroom because English is not available to them. If English is available to them, then sure, that will help to support their learning. If it isn't, then you cannot achieve as much as you could if it was. So, I have here, as they come up, a couple of pictures. This is wonderful. Every child in this classroom has a computer. How many places does that have? Or how many places uh, like the other example, which is the classroom I was in in India uh, last month. There's no furniture. Now that is not necessarily a problem. Because if you have furniture and it's fixed, it means you've, the children find it very difficult to move about, to form groups, to do pair work, and so on and so forth. So, and if children, they sit on the floor on mats, they're quite comfortable doing that. My only criticism of this would be, the teacher should be down there with them. <laughs> the teacher should be at the children's level. Because that, if the teacher is at the children's level, it changes the entire dynamics of the classroom. But when the teacher is up there, holding the book, instructing, being superior, then that means that the teaching and learning dynamics are really different. If you're working as this is in a primary school, get down to the student's level. Again, it is cultural. It is cultural. Because in Indian society, the teacher is the provider of knowledge. 
But again, that's something that we have to work to change. So again, we're working here in this state by beginning to get the children and the teacher to do more activities, to use more English in the classroom and not just Hindi, to do more pair work and group work, and they begin to see the benefits. So maybe later, we can get the teacher to start thinking about moving down and talking to the children at their level. So there are always these stages in, in development. And one of the problems with curriculum development is that somebody develops a new curriculum, it's implemented, and somebody somewhere in the ministry thinks everything's going to change overnight. It doesn't. It takes years. It takes years. I was working in Sri Lanka for seven, six, six months, seven years in total. Six years on one project. Towards the end of that project, with all of our trainer training and teacher training, and our curriculum development and our textbook development, towards the end of those six years, we saw the signs of change. And it takes that amount of time. Teachers are not going to reject their traditional ways of doing things, which have served them very well for many years in their career, just because you say this is better. So it's a long process if, with a new curriculum of changing your teacher's belief systems. Think how difficult it would be to change your own belief systems. Yeah. <laughs> They're built up over time. And when we are adults, Obviously, they are, they are much firmer, much more fixed than if we were children. So, it's a challenge, and it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, my, my next, I think I, I'm, I'm going to not spend a great deal of time on this. And what I'll simply do for, for this is to refer you to where you can find lots of useful information. Because this is, this is the what of learning. We're talking about teaching and learning processes, the how, the what. what. What bits of English are you going to teach to your students? To me, this, me, this is relatively easy. Because people have been making these decisions for decades, if not hundreds of years. So why should we start from scratch? The British Council have done a lot of work for you. And one of the great things about the British Council's um, work is that so much of the resources are available freely on, on their website, on the teaching <coughs> English website, on, on the learning English websites. So if you are lucky enough to have access to a good internet connection, or you have a tablet or a smartphone, then you can get hold of these things. And on it, you, you will find things like, this is their core inventory for general English, which you won't be able to see. <laughs> but let's see if we can look at the small part of it. So we have for this is the again the common European framework of reference CEFR levels for A1. They think that these functions should be covered at this level. Directions, describing habits and routines, giving personal information, greetings, telling the time, understanding using numbers, understanding using prices. We have vocabulary, food and drink, nationalities and countries, personal information, things in the town, shops and shopping, verbs, topics, things personal to students, family life, and so on. So all of the, there are many things like this available which we can use as a basis for content of our own curriculum appropriate to Brazil. Again, as, as we, uh, we, we have had warnings already, you can't just take this and say, they've done it, it's good for them, it's good for us. Adaptation, using what is there as a basis and making it relevant to your own context is, is a critical thing. What about the learners? The who that we have of, of learning? So, who is our curriculum for? Ultimately, it's for the children in the, in the classes, isn't it? It's not for the people in the ministry. 
That's how our job is to educate. Our, our primary concern is the students and making sure that they have access to good quality English language teaching. This is what it's all about. But the problem is we never consult them about their experiences of the curriculum. They are always the object of the curriculum. They are never participating in the process of its development. So many conferences like this one from UNESCO recommend that students need to be the center of, center of any reform. We're always saying this, but we're rarely doing it. So how can we do it? How can we involve students? Delayed reaction. Okay. Well, why don't we talk to teachers? We talk to people in universities. Sometimes we even talk to employers about English. Why should we talk to the students? Why should we get the students' views on the existing curriculum and the existing textbooks? Why shouldn't we ask the students what they think they want, what might be useful and relevant to them? We never do, that I know of, but it would be useful to, to start doing it. If we have the views of people who have recently left school, and have moved into the workforce, ask them. Now that you're in a job, now that you're working, what would you have liked? What would have been good for you? And then we can use that information in, in our curriculum. So this will tell us about the curriculum as experience. And then that will help to make the new curriculum as intended more relevant to the students' needs. And I think this is something for me which is essential, but which is so rarely done. So, I'm moving to a conclusion. But in my conclusion, my conclusion is not the end of it. So, for me, if we look at these, um, <coughs> curriculum development has to be multifaceted. It has to consider social roles and values in the wider society. It has to consider processes of teaching and learning, which, which mesh with what we know about second language acquisition. It has to think about the English language knowledge and skills which are required at various levels, at primary level, at, at lower secondary, upper secondary, at university. Once if we take all of these things into account, then we can develop our basic principles to, to guide the curriculum development process. So again, I've got an, an example from Vietnam. And they, so for them, I didn't do that. themes, topics, community competences, and linguistic items. It will promote the use of the four skills, speaking, listening, reading, and writing equally. It will be learning-centered. It will promote skills for lifelong learning among students. It will promote learning through various media, including e-resources. And it should prepare students to use English for immediate employment, as well as for academic purposes. It will contribute to the general education and development of the students and promote good moral values appropriate to participation in the Vietnamese society. And yes, we should specify learning outcomes which are aligned with level B1 of the CEFR. So they do say we need this much English, B1, on the CEFR. So again, that is an ambitious 
objective, I feel, for Vietnamese schools. <coughs> Very ambitious. And I, I personally, I was against it, but I was told it had to be there. So as a curriculum developer, often we don't have the freedom that we think we, we should have. The government said this. <laughs> and that's what the government wants, and that's what the government has. But what this simply means is that later on, when it comes to the curriculum as experienced, then it, it's not going to meet these objectives as intended. But that's reality. We have to deal with reality. So, now we have a challenge. I put the principles into practice so as to design a curriculum which meets the present and future needs of the students and teachers for whom it is intended within the educational system and society of which it is required. So that is our challenge. And I wish you luck in, in achieving this. <laughs> But if, as we have seen from the conference over the last few days, there are so many of us here who are aware of realities, who appreciate the teaching and learning situation, who are committed to doing things better, that, that with this, with this you know, groundswell of opinion, it's now up to us to see what we can do at an individual level to make a difference. It's our responsibility. So if we can't just say, oh, other people make these decisions and we have no part in it. Well, why, well we, are, we are part of the society. It's up to us to, to claim that, that space for our voices. And, and I can't presume to tell you how to do that here. But you will know how to make your voices heard. And so I, I urge you to do so. Make your voices heard. Because everything that I have I've heard and experienced in the past day and a half is that you, you can make a difference. So my, my final word for this uh, talk is please go, please go and make a difference. Thank you very much. But even, even so, the problem for me is that there is not much reinforcement beyond the classroom. And this is, this is the issue. So what we all know is, yes, if you have this certain number of hours, you can reach this level. If you had all of your hours at once, if you started on week one and you finished in, in week 20 or whatever, and you did nothing but English, and you could practice outside the classroom, then yes, you can achieve that level. But all of the research shows us that if you have this drip, 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 the drip feed approach, yeah. then it takes you much longer to reach that level. Because you, you forget. So you have to keep going back and doing the same thing, redoing it, hopefully in different ways, to, to develop and to reinforce your understanding. So school, school, any school curriculum will need constant recycling of previously learned material. So that slows down, and everything is slowed down in acquisition terms, in, in, in this drip feed approach. But as, sorry, one final point, as we know, it's simply not practical in a, in a school 
than to say, okay, we're going to do nothing else for three months but English. So we can't say, oh, we want all of our time at the end of group five. It's just not practical. That's reality. Uh, my question is uh, regarding teacher training, teacher education, and your experience in these countries. I, I would like to know, first of all, what they, how do they uh, think this through, these countries that you have worked for, and if there's any teacher participation in these decisions, how much participation is there, how much resistance, because I think a lot of times some of these problems that you've mentioned are what we call first world problems, you know. I think I'm sure you've heard this from people before. Um, here we have a, a very heterogeneous reality if you compare private schools here in Sao Paulo. So how does that work with teachers and resistance and teacher education? Well, I think teachers resist most when they don't understand. So again, so when, when Alex, talk about the experience I had in Sri Lanka, where I stayed longest. I was there for six years, continuously. And we, we started with, um, we didn't, we didn't begin with um, the curriculum. We began with trainer training. So what we were doing is helping to develop the teacher trainers. Because we realized that if we don't start with the teacher trainers, then everything else failed. So our first priority was trainer training. And then we moved to teacher training. And, and it was the teacher training, to begin with in-service teacher training, helping to develop teacher skills so that then they would be more receptive to the new curriculum when it came. And then we started to develop the curriculum and the, the textbooks to go with it. But the, 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 the radical thing that we did with the textbooks was to recruit primary school teachers, because this was a, a primary school program, we recruited primary school teachers to, to write books. So what we did is we, we advertised across the island, we had a little test, a materials writing test, and we were looking for people with potential. But nobody had ever done it before. And we, we recruited uh, uh, a dozen people, a dozen people with, with potential, and then we gave them training in how to write materials and how to work the textbooks. Because we knew that the teachers would be the best resources of what would work in the classroom. But this is this was not again wasn't common. But Again, I was lucky in this situation because I was in charge of the project. I controlled the budgets. And so I could do this. I could allocate money to this. And, and, and there was opposition to it. Primary school teachers? What do they know about textbook writing? And I would say to the in the ministry, what do you know about primary school teaching? <laughs> So we had this, 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 this impasse, but again, we, we, so we gave our, our, our primary school teachers training in material writing, and then they could go and trial things in their own classes. So they could test whether the materials were. And then, of course, we, we have the whole process of, of revision and so on and so forth. And we, again, in our materials writing team, we had to have balance. Now, because it was primary schools, there were not many men. So there was a gender imbalance, because again, the reality is that most primary school teachers, particularly of English, are women. But the balance that we then tried to achieve was, because it's a multi-ethnic society, we had to have Tamils, and we had to have Sinhalese. Because again, this was at the time when Sri Lanka was still at war, they had, as you will know, 26 years of civil war. So one of the purposes of the textbook was to show how Sinhalese and Tamil children in an English textbook could be happy together. So we 
we, we, we did try this. So once we developed pages for the textbook, we sent them out. And some of the comments that we got back were, this picture shows how Singhalese and Tawals and Muslims can live together, unlike our present society. <laughs> so it was aspirational. So an English language textbook cannot solve an ethnic conflict. But it has its own part to play. We can't ignore it. Again, it's this, this, this social context. So we were trying to make sure the books that we develop portrayed this positive, this positive picture of Singhalese and Tamils and Muslims living and working together. And, and we were successful in that. Now, again, the problem, of course, is in wider society, this was not happening. But we can, we, our objective was to influence the, the young generation and hope that that would not be negated totally by what was happening outside the school. Um, we'll see. We'll see. So, so again, it's the whole process of the trainer training, the teacher training, the curriculum and the textbooks all working together to change the way that that English was taught and learned. And as I said, towards the end of the six years, because again, when we, we gathered our data every year, we could see signs of change. So early on, everybody had very positive responses to the courses, the trainer training and the teacher training. But obviously our interest after six years was what's happening in the classroom. And things were beginning to change. And so we were happy with that. I would have liked to stay longer, but unfortunately the British government didn't provide the funding for the project. So the Sri Lankan government had to take it over and pursue it. Do you have any anything that you have after six years? We didn't have any formal data because we couldn't collect it. But the, the informal response is, is the, the training courses still run. And I have to say now that unfortunately they're still using the same books. And for me, it's now this is this is now ten years ago. They should have revised them by now, but they haven't done. So in a way, you can say, well, it means that they're happy with the books, which they are. But still, I would say it's time to look at them again. It's time to, it's time to change. And one positive thing also is that the people who we were writing the books, obviously they move up in, in the educational layers. So some of those materials writers are now themselves teacher trainers. So the, the influence is there spreading throughout the system. But I, I'm always optimistic. <laughs> Well, when I have the opportunity to teach those courses, yes. Them with what they needed for the workplace. Yeah. 
So, you know, in fact, the government is actually supplying a lot of work to the independent English language teaching um, network because they're not doing their job. You know, we want to be clear about it. Uh, and then you asked another question about, um, well, does everyone need to learn English? And maybe not. Maybe, you know, we, we did a, a British Council, we did some research, we found that just a little bit over 5% of the population speaks English, so that's about 10 million people speak some English. Um, but if, we, if, if it's decided at some level that not everyone needs to speak English and then English is not taught um, in, in schools, then how do you make the decision who to include and who to exclude? You know, For me, I, I, I wouldn't exclude anybody. Yeah. But I wouldn't have as an objective um, learning English in order to participate in the global economy. I would have as my objective learning English for intercultural understanding and learning English because it's, it's fun to learn the language. Yeah. So it's a question of expectation. So if I think I go to learn English because I can get a job in some international company, I, I may be frustrated in that objective. But if I think I'm learning English because learning, learning languages is, is in itself a desirable thing to do, then, then that's a different thing. For me, learning languages, everyone should learn languages. But with the, again, for the, for the, um, the private language schools, I think for the Oturas, only throughout the country, they have 250,000 students, I was told. They're not the last. No, they're most, um, probably the most prominent. Yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah, they're, they're probably the most prominent, but they're not the largest. So there are some networks, private networks, that have close to million students. Yeah, that work with franchise system and so on. So perhaps we should ask those people why they're not doing it. For work mainly, for work and, and for social ascension, because they, they leave school, they start working, and they realize. Um, well, English is going to help me somehow, yeah. and that's when they really, they really start to take interest in learning. But then again, you see the struggle having worked with adults. You see the struggle that they go through because many of them are working, yeah. studying, even undergrad, postgrad, and trying to learn English so that they can get a better job. And there just isn't enough time and energy to do everything, and then you don't succeed the way that you could. So. Okay, I understand all that. They have the motivation. In school, depending on how we approach it, um, children may not have the motivation. So we have to be very careful about how we teach English in school in order not to demotivate children. So I, I came across a study in Korea recently where, where a colleague of mine interviewed six grade six children. What does English mean to you in grade six in Korea? A prison for life. <laughs> Something that should not exist. Hell. So most children in grade six in this study had very negative attitudes towards English. And they had plenty of time for it. Their parents sent them to private tuition and so on and so forth. But honestly, that's wrong. They should not have any attitudes like that. So something is going wrong. And it may be in the way that English is taught. But that's the key thing. If, if we do say, it's not my decision, if we do say that there should be more English in schools in Brazil, then we must be very careful about how we teach it and what our objectives are in order not to demotivate children and turn them against learning languages. It starts, well, teachers are important. So the teachers, the students, the trainers, the curriculum developers, we all need a shared purpose. Is it lunchtime? Yeah, it's lunch, so it's okay. Unless, uh, you want me to, yeah. so, uh, I can do it, should I do it? Yeah. One and one last question, and then we'll go and no, oh, it's okay. So it's interesting, my question was pretty much what your question was. Oh. A little bit more complicated in a way, because
because it seems like there's a contradiction in terms of um, wanting to prevent uh, one class of people from attaining high levels of efficiency and being more successful or earning a better living on the one hand, and the other um, objective of not um, setting goals that are not realistic. So it, it is sort of the same, right? If, if you don't train everyone for the same kind of position, in a way you're creating an underclass in a sense. On the other hand, how productive is it to train everybody for high level positions when they're not that many high level positions? So with me, it, English is just one part of thing. So if we're talking about English, I, I always want to see it within the context of education as a whole. And, and my, my goal will be to, to provide quality education for all children, irrespective of background. So at least they have access to opportunity. And obviously uh, different children will take different advantage of that and develop in different ways. But we have to make sure that everybody has access to quality education. And I see access to quality English as, as part of that. But I, I struggle with this, again, this conundrum of, of English, but not everybody needs it. And right. only some people will be requiring, and so on and so forth. Which is why I, I'm moving away from, I don't think that we should be thinking about fluency and proficiency in school and learning English for economic purposes. I think we should just be thinking about learning English in school to help us to respect other cultures, to enhance intercultural understanding, and because it's good to learn languages and see things through the lens of another culture, rather than focusing too much on achieving B1 at the end of lower secondary. So I think that kind of objective is also doomed to failure. Now I think you've earned your lunch. Yeah, thank you.